option. And um, we've got a little tiny change in plans. Um, we, uh, as uh, uh, Doug was saying, we had our built environment network um, for the last two days. And on Wednesday, uh, Jim Crabb from Mazzetti gave uh, a presentation to the group um, about this topic. And uh, Doug and I both thought it was great and we thought it might be a nice way to introduce the, the session today. So we both asked Jim to join us um, and, and do uh, the same presentation that he did for the Ben um, because it's a nice uh, overview about the topic. Um, and then we're gonna have that followed by Jonathan uh, from ASHI, and then Doug's going to talk about some of the work that uh, FGI is doing around uh, guidelines and uh, trying to address uh, some of the issues that came up with, uh, with and during COVID. Um, so that's kind of the flow of the day. And uh, we are planning on recording the session because uh, we got notes from some of the people that couldn't attend uh, the session today but wanted to listen in. And as I said in our uh, email, we're, uh, we're going to do this in two parts um, because uh, some of the speakers couldn't join us uh, today. So we're going to have, this is part one, um, and then we'll have part two on July 10th. Um, and uh, uh, we may have the uh, speakers from today join us back. Um, we're going to have um, the other people from ASHRAE come and talk about some of their work, and then we'll... Uh, have an opportunity for discussion about kind of taking from the broad perspective, this whole topic, and then talking more specifically about some of the details and some of the things that you guys want to do uh, very spe specifically around negative air um, and air handling and, and all of that in not just the inpatient setting, but ambulatory settings and even the office buildings. So, um, I'm, and uh, I think the way we want to run it today is, is have Jim and uh, Jonathan and Doug talk, um, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, but if when they're talking, if you have a clarifying question, um, you know, please go ahead and ask that. But we, we want to try to hold the discussion for the second hour of the meeting. Um, the other thing, if you want to, um, you're welcome to type your questions into the chat box um, so um, we can see them and uh, make sure we get to them. And, and it's a way for you not to forget it <laughs> as we're going along as well. Um, and I think that's it. We're, looks like most of you know each other, but um, if you have a question, um, if you want to just introduce yourselves, um, when you ask your question, that way we can, uh, the speakers know who you are. Um, and I think with that, I'm gonna go ahead and have us get started because I know uh, we've got um, you know, a lot to get through with the different presentations. So I'm gonna introduce Jim Crabb. Um, Jim is uh, the, uh, one of the mechanical engineers and principals at Mazzetti and works out of the Atlanta office. And as I said, Jim, uh, did this great presentation for uh, the Ben group. And so I think it's a nice way to sort of set up the discussion. So Jim, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, very good. Thank you, Donna. Uh, so yes, I am Jim Crabb. I'm with Mazzetti. I've been uh, a mechanical engineer in the healthcare business for um, uh, a long time, let's just say, uh, well over 30 years now. Um, been working in uh, in hospitals doing ventilation, but more recently, obviously with uh, the the things that have been happening this year, I've really been uh, digging in and doing a lot of uh, what I'll call research, uh, not not scientific research, but re research in terms of going through and and every study I can find, every piece of literature I can find. Uh, trying to make sure I understand what I can about this virus in particular and uh, and especially what it means for ventilation because it's easy for I think for uh, for us ventilation engineers to uh, assume that we have the solution to everything and I think the reality is that um, there's a lot more to it than ventilation and sometimes ventilation isn't even really that much of an issue 
So I thought what we would do is just do a, sort of a run through what, what I'll call the science. Some of it is, uh, is real science. Some of it is just what we know today and, uh, and uh, really kind of talk through those kind of issues. Um, and I'm, I'm very aware that as engineers, we kind of have a role in this. Um, we have to get things done, whether we have the, the final science or not. We are charged with uh, um, making the systems work, doing what we can, and uh, sometimes we have to make decisions without all of the knowledge available. But in terms of ventilation, it kind of comes down to um, the, the virus. Is it, is it really flying or is it just following the style? Um, and that comes down to droplets versus aerosol. And what we mean, I'm gonna use this terminology. Um, it's not, there, there's no uh, science behind, uh, this is the word we have to use for this. We talk a lot about airborne, uh, but airborne to me can be droplet or aerosol. But the droplets are the things that are just following the style, whereas the aerosol is the thing that sort of remains flying through the air very fine particles that are carried by air currents. Um, there was a study done a while back that looked at how many droplets are released and what's the sort of size distribution of those drop droplets, because that matters for what we're talking about. Uh, this is for a sneeze. Um, the majority of the particles are over here in the, what I would call the large particles, the droplets. And then there's a decent percentage that are over here in the 100 microns or less category. And that's what we really care about in terms of uh, aerosolization. This stuff over here is droplet. Uh, use my pointer here, I forgot it. This stuff over here is, is droplets and they tend to fall out. And this stuff over here tends to either, it's small enough to be airborne to begin with or it will desiccate fairly quickly and become something small and light and remain airborne. Um, I thought this was interesting also, just the, the difference in number of droplets released uh, for sneezing, coughing, and speaking loudly. Even speaking loudly is a, is a fairly healthy number of droplets. Um, and here's why we care about the size of the droplets. Um, these larger droplets tend to fall fairly quickly. Uh, but if this 100 micron droplet desiccates and becomes a smaller drop, uh, droplet, then we're going to start calling it an aerosol. And you can see smaller things in turbulent air. This is half-life, not total settling. So half-life means roughly half the particles have settled. So after 40 hours in these really small particles, uh, they're only half have settled. So this kind of gets to the question of, is it airborne, airborne or not? Uh, the CDC guidance that was up on the website back in March included this statement, airborne transmission from person to person over long distances is unlikely. And the over long distances there is a reference to essentially aerosol transmission. Uh, that's no longer on their website. Uh, I believe you've been sent the, uh, the ASHRAE position document on infectious, infectious diseases, infectious aerosols. I can't remember what the term is, but um, that document includes this statement. And I think this is, this is really where a lot of us in ventilation had been uh, for some time. And that is that transmission through the air is sufficiently likely that we should pay attention to that. Um, the primary method of transmission, everything says currently is still droplet, uh, but there are a few things that have happened that can't be completely explained by large droplets. And this kind of gets to, to another part of this. Yeah, Jim, this is Doug. We talked about this yesterday. Mm -hmm. And the, what we did was we were looking at, is this going to be transmitted through the ventilation system? You know, will it get through into the ductwork and to the filters and be sent someplace else as a result of our uh, 
recirculating our, our air. And so far, from what we've heard from various folks within APIC, the Association for Professionals Infection Control and Epidemiology, is that it is not moving through the ventilation systems. But I think that's where Jim is going. I don't think the evidence is hard evidence yet, as we saw with SARS. We didn't think that SARS did either until it did move through the ventilation systems up in, I think it was Toronto, where we had some of the issues. So I just wanted to throw that in, Jim. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's the key, Doug. Right now, we don't have any proof that it is. Uh, but we, there are things we know about the way um, uh, droplet, you know, respiratory droplets work that say that this thing is in the air and the particles are moving through the air system. The question is, are they infectious? Um, and, and that gets to the question of the infectious dose. In order to become sick from anything, you have to be susceptible and you have to be exposed to enough of the thing to get infected yourself. Um, so that's a, in terms of an airborne aerosol, uh, it's a, a question of concentration in the air times the time and a whole lot of other factors that we don't understand uh, or don't know enough about yet anyway. The problem is we don't know what the infectious dose is. Is it one particle? Not likely. Is it 100? Is it 1,000? Is it 20,000? And over what period of time? Those are the questions that uh, haven't been answered yet and it's likely will not be answered for a long time. Even with SARS, we don't have the answer yet to what the infectious dose is. Um, we do know that it varies. Uh, there is some evidence that the that COVID-19, the infectious dose, is higher than SARS, um, but there's still too much we don't know about that yet. So it's important to remember that ventilation is only one part of the answer. Ventilation can help control the uh, infectious particles at the source. It can help dilute so that the concentration is lower. We can control the direction of airflow to some degree, and uh, we can also control humidity. But HVAC can also contribute to the spread. Um, this is a situation, uh, you probably heard about this restaurant in Guangzhou, China, um, where there is one infected person in this restaurant. This is the third floor of the restaurant, and there's an air conditioning unit sitting over here and all these other red people uh, became infected over the course of the lunch. Interestingly though, these people over here didn't and these people over here didn't. So the theory is that, that this air conditioning system was blowing across the tables here and was sufficiently strong current to distribute this disease to these other people. Uh, that's not big, heavy droplets. Uh, it's some, probably something shy of aerosol though. There's, it was being carried just enough uh, to, uh, to infect those people. And, and another thing about this is if these small, part, small droplets desiccate, um, does that reduce their infectivity? Probably it does. Some, th some uh, microbial agents can desiccate and then as soon as they rehydrate, they're back to what they were, they're infectious. It's sort of looking like that may not be the case with COVID and that's good news. So let's talk about these different uh, things that ventilation can do. Source control is the first step and that is uh, isolating people um, is the, the most obvious thing that we do. And the CDC guidance continues to be that when you have a person either in, that known to be infected or suspected, you put them in a, in a room by themselves and close the door. Ideally, that room has, a, has a toilet facilities so that they don't have to leave the room. Um, but they didn't, the, the key to that is they're not saying it has to be an airborne infectious isolation room. They're saying it has to be a room with a door. Um, Another thing we can do is exhaust near the infected patient, um, especially when we're doing aerosol, uh, aerosol generating procedures. 
Uh, the CDC talks about this. There, there's sort of the normal patient breathing, doing normal things. And then there are procedures that we do where aerosols are, we know aerosols are generated. Um, again, we don't know how infectious that is, but we know they're generated and we assume that there is, they are somewhat infectious. So if we can exhaust right near those procedures uh, and reduce the, num the amount of aerosol that gets out into the wild, then uh, we're probably better off. And the guidance continues to be for aerosol generating procedures. If you have access to a, an airborne infectious isolation room, that's the place to do it. This is just an example of how the path, the design of the ventilation system can make a difference. Uh, what you have on the left, this is a, C, uh, a CFD model, can, uh, computational fluid dynamics model of airflow in a room. And the red lines are particles being traced. They, the particles are emitted by the patient on the bed. And this is the path they take on their way out of the room through that little blue uh, square there is a uh, return grill. In this case, the supply diffuser is a linear slot sitting at the foot end of the room and the return grill is near the door. So particles move around. This is a, the same room, but the model changed and the return grill is on the ceiling directly above the bed. And it's hard to see here, but this black line is the same supply diffuser, but it's been moved over to here and it's throwing in that direction, throwing toward the foot of the bed. And the red here is the same particles being released, but they are going straight up to the return grill. Now, this is not meant to scare people. This is not to say, oh my gosh, look what happens here. Um, these, anyone in the room is gonna be infected. Uh, what we're saying, what I'm suggesting by looking at this is there are relatively small things we can do in the design of our HVAC systems that could make a big difference in uh, how infective uh, this disease might be. Dilution is the primary thing we do with ventilation systems. Um, it's important to remember dilution, dilution is meant to reduce cross-contamination. So uh, within a room, dilution might not be the most effective thing to do. If, if you have a room with a, an infected patient, aerosol generating procedures, we can't dilute it fast enough to protect people. You need to have PPE. Dilution is about protecting uh, from a longer distance. So the classic ways of dilution, ventilate with outdoor air. In hospital spaces, we talk about two air changes or something like that of outdoor air. Sometimes we can't really increase the amount of outdoor air we have and filtration is a way to deal with that. There are air cleaning systems such as ultraviolet germicidal irradiation that can, can help with dilution effectively. Um, and then the other thing that dilution does is remove particles. So if you have a, an infected patient in a room and you want to wait for that room to clear before you bring in the next patient, uh, wait for that room to clear of aerosols that might have been generated. Uh, the CDC guidance uh, talks about the uh, time for a 99% removal at different air change rates. Now let's talk a little bit more about filtration because there was uh, a lot of talk early on about this disease being this virus is so small it's not likely to be trapped by HEPA filters and that comes from the uh, the fact that most viral particles are 0.1 micron or smaller uh, roughly in this range and we all know that HEPA filters are rated at 0.3 microns and the, the, th the thinking was that, well, this is too small to be stopped by the HEPA filter. But the reality is HEPA filters are rated at 0.3 microns because that's where they do their worst performance. So at 0.3 microns, the, the standard HEPA filter is 99.7% effective, or maybe it's 99.99 or 97 or whatever. But um, the point is that at smaller particle sizes, it goes back to much higher efficiency. And at larger particle sizes, it goes back to much higher efficiency. As a, and the same curve applies to our typical 90, 95% 
MERV 14 filter, uh, it's just, it's a bigger curve because it dips down here into the 50, 50 to 60% uh, effective range in, in that particle size. So the 90, 95% filter is doing some good for sure. 50% reduction is a whole lot better than, than these typical MERV 8 filters but HEPA filter effectively for this kind of thing can be considered an absolute. Air that passes through a HEPA filter is clean. Yes, sir, Doug. Yeah, Jim, could you talk a little bit about the static pressure difference in the newer HEPA filters versus the old style HEPAs? That's because we had, a, we had a great presentation by Camphill about the fact that the newer HEPAs have very, very little pressure drop across their, their um, filter. They have certainly improved. Uh, we used to allow for a minimum of an inch across a HEPA filter, and we can get them now um, with reasonable airflow uh, velocities at um, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 inch. They're getting close to the old 9095s, uh, but actually the 995s have also gotten better. So we have, we can actually reduce the, the Delta P of a, of a MERV 14 as well. So there's still a difference between HEPA and MERV 14, but it's not what it used to be. And it's, and overall, both of them are lower potentially if we buy the right filters, it's pretty easy to just buy the cheapest filters, but um, it, I think it's really important to pay attention to the type of filter you're buying. There are improved media. There are filters with improved surface area, larger surface area, a V-bank shaped filter where you, you just get a lot more surface area. It's the main issue. And at least one of the manufacturers also now has one that is um, more resistant to moisture. I don't know that that matters a lot in this situation, but uh, there, is, there is some improvement happening in that area. Uh, the other thing we talk about, of course, is directional airflow. Air should move from clean to less clean, clean to dirty. Uh, we talk about a differential pressure of 0.01 inch uh, required by ASHRAE 170 for ORs, uh, infectious isolation rooms, and, uh, and a few other spaces. But that pressure differential is not really the goal. Uh, the, the, what we're after is the movement of air and the pressure differential is one way that we look at that to say that the area is going to move in the direction we want. But 0.01 is not a magic number. Um, Anti-rooms are better. There is um, more information available now. Some studies have been done about anti-rooms and their effectiveness. And uh, I, I, the ASHRAE position document has, uh, has now stated that if, um, if there's a known infect airborne infectious disease, you should have an anteroom between the isolation room and the rest of the world. Um, but the design of that anteroom is critical. It's not just put a room in there, put a, a build, build a few walls and a door and call it done. Uh, the actual airflow through that is important. Um, again, directional airflow, negative pressure can reduce cross contamination but this does actually nothing to protect staff in a dirty room. So within a negative pressure room, doesn't matter if it's negative pressure, positive pressure, who cares? If you're in there, you're not being protected by that pressure differential. That's to keep the, the nasties from moving out of the room. Ultraviolet uh, is known to kill many bacteria and viruses. Uh, the dosage that it takes to kill specific um, microbial agents varies with the agent. Um, so it's important to pay attention to what that required dose is. We don't know yet what it is for COVID-19. There are enough surrogates for that that we, we can be reasonably comfortable that, that we know approximately what the dose is. And typically if you're doing a UVC um, system, you're gonna take whatever known dose you need and you're gonna apply a pretty hefty safety factor anyway, just because there are some unknowns in the process. Um, but at, in the long term, uh, if you're thinking of using UVGI for whatever might be coming, there are a lot of unknowns about that. 
UV for air cleaning requires a lot of energy and time. That's the equation, energy times time is the dosage. And so you won't, in an air handling system where you're moving at 500 feet per minute, you don't have much time, so you have to have very high energy. You increase the amount of time of the exposure by extending the, size, the length of the air unit or the duct where this, uh, where this energy is being introduced, um, but it takes a good bit. On the other hand, in my view, there's no question UV is great for cleaning coils. Um, in fact, the first place where we proved that was, uh, was at Don Gay's facility. Um, I was just looking at the numbers from that recently and coils can be kept very clean by UV. But that system, the, the image that I'm showing you here is a UV system designed for cleaning coils that is nowhere near sufficient for actual air cleaning. And there are alternatives out there. Uh, there, are, there are lots of people willing to sell you a system that is proven to kill viruses. Um, photocatalytic oxidation is one of those. It's a combination of a titanium dioxide catalyst and ultraviolet. Um, I, I see nothing wrong with that technology, but no one has proven yet that it is going to be effective at any virus, let alone, uh, let alone COVID-19. Bipolar ionization, mother nature's way of cleaning uh, is another thing that's out there. And again, there are, there are commissioned laboratory studies that demonstrate some sort of effectiveness. There are testimonials about how, how I put this in and the air was cleaner. Um, there is not science. Um, in fact, one of the studies for the bipolar ionization, um, they came out recently and said they had, they had demonstrated effectiveness against COVID-19. And what they did was they demonstrated that COVID-19 over some period of time uh, becomes inactive in the presence of bipolar ionization. It might have been inactivated without bipolar ionization. They didn't test that. They just said, in the presence of bipolar ionization, it became less, uh, less active. Uh, I consider that to be um, not helpful. So even though there are these things out there and they sound great, it would be great if we could just install bipolar ionization on all our air handlers, we'd be done with this thing. There's no science to say that that's correct. So an alternative would be, um, if, if everyone's using PPE, do we even need to modify our HVAC systems? Um, if we could get all of our mild to moderate COVID positive patients to wear face coverings, a surgical mask, uh, do we need any special ventilation? Those are questions. Um, but I would also suggest that there's another thing we need to think about. Um, you, you folks are in facilities where you are essentially responsible for the health and safety of the staff, as well as the patients and visitors that come in, but primarily you have a responsibility to your staff. And your staff needs to, needs to want to show up to work every day and take care of patients. Otherwise you're out of business. And staff needs to believe that they're being taken care of. And sometimes that might mean that you need to take steps that are not proven that are not proven to be necessary by science. Um, and in my, the perfect example of that to me is the TSA. Uh, we all know that a lot of the procedures that the TSA does may not actually make us any safer. In the early days of the TSA, when they were confiscating uh, nail clippers, I'm pretty sure that didn't make anyone safer. Uh, but it was part of the theater of, of safety and security and whether you want to argue about the details of those things, um, the overall effect is that the TSA has been pretty darned effective in, in creating security, uh, even if not everything they do is necessary. And it might be that in our facilities, we need to do similar kinds of things. So that's not an engineering question. That's a, uh, a policy question that uh, that you have to answer inside your facility. 
So I'll stop there. Uh, I hope that was quick and crisp enough, Donna. Uh, <laughs> great. Thanks, Jim. Thank you so much. Um, you're yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, so I, uh, I'm going to keep us moving and we're going to go on to uh, Jonathan. And then um, we'll finish up with Doug and then we'll open it up for questions and comments. Okay, Great, Doug. appreciate it. Thanks, Donna. Um, and Jill, I believe you're gonna share and run the slides, right? Um, so I just wanted to talk about, I, I was asked to uh, uh, kind of give an overview of ASHI and what ashi has been doing and some of the things we've got that are available for folks. Um, so I'm gonna talk about pre-recovery, some of the, our pre-recovery recommendations. I'm gonna talk about some short-term recommendations, term recommendations, and then uh, one, probably the, one of the biggest things we've got is the inspection testing and maintenance when it comes to the physical environment, the inspection testing and maintenance. Uh, we have a checklist and, an, and a way to document things that need to be done. Just to, focus on ASHI's um, recommendations for ventilation. Uh, one of the things we did very early on was we went to a recommending uh, negative pressure in rooms where COVID positive patients were, were being uh, cared for. Um, it, and we did that specifically because of two studies that had come out that did show early on that the virus was moving through the air some. Um, there have been uh, subsequent studies that pretty well indicate that it doesn't get into the ventilation systems, but that it does move in the air within the rooms. Um, all of the studies, even the subsequent studies, have not yet tested the virality or the, the infectiousness of the virus when it's moving. So that, as, uh, as was previously talked about, uh, that's a big unknown at, at this moment. But one of the things that we wanted to do and, and what we focused on with our recommendation for negative pressure patient rooms was specifically, as Jim talked, protection of the staff. When you've got staff that are in a medical unit all day long, making sure that the air is moving from clean to less clean, so from, you know, from the corridor area into the patient room, which would be less clean because the patient is there and is, you know, is spreading the virus, um, was just a way to help protect staff. And we felt very strongly that that was very important that that was done. Um, Jill, if you could go to the first, first slide, actually the next one after this, we're going to talk about some pre-recovery items. Um, one of the things that we're looking at now, of course, is, and this, you know, we were looking previously at the fact that the curve was starting to flatten and come down. Of course, here in the last couple of weeks, in the last 10 to 14 days, we've actually seen a significant increase in cases throughout the country. Um, so, and, and again, most folks are not seeing this as a second wave, but are recognizing that this is a continuation of the first wave. Um, so, you know, pre-recovery planning, maybe a little early, some folks might be thinking, but we know that recovery is gonna happen. We will get a vaccine at some point, and at some point we'll step out of this and we'll be going to, I highly doubt we'll be going back to normal, what was pre-COVID, but we will be going to what would be considered a new norm. So we wanted to make sure that folks were doing pre-recovery planning. Um, and what's very important about this is making sure that you're part of the bigger picture. Um, you know, we focus on ventilation, we focus on the physical environment, on you know, the life safety issues and those kind of things quite often. In this type of a scenario, it's just like any recovery from a natural disaster or from the pandemic of this nature. You need to really focus on being part of the bigger picture. Uh, so helping people to understand to be part of that bigger picture, to get involved with some of the modeling that needs to be going on. Um, 
you know, we feel pretty strongly that there were some very quick decisions made that weren't thought probably were well weren't thought through very well. Um, you know, the the cessation of all elective services for every hospital in the United States was was a bad decision, um, and was made very quickly because we knew surge was going to happen, and we wanted to protect people, and we wanted to make sure that there was the healthcare system was protected and that they were able to go ahead and um, meet that surge. But unfortunately, we didn't take into consideration all the true modeling in every county throughout the United States. And we have put many facilities at a significant risk now due to financial issues. So that type of thing was very, you know, was if we had, if, the powers to be had taken and allowed people to do risk assessments for their situation, we probably could have avoided that. So again, being involved in some of that modeling, being involved with those discussions with the team as a whole, with your organization as a whole is very important. Um, we strongly recommend staying in touch with the CDC's recommendations and following those as best you can um, when they make sense and within your organization. Um, you know, you really need to make recovery planning, pre-recovery planning for your closed or underutilized spaces. Uh, that's a very important thing. Uh, one thing we don't want to do is to come out of this pandemic and then have thousands of cases of Legionella or Cytomosis or those type of diseases because we've shut places down and then we didn't take care of the water systems. Um, we've had quite a bit of discussion on mechanical systems, but you know, making sure that they're operating efficiently that they're being maintained and taken care of throughout this is very important. Uh, let's move on to the next section. So we'll talk about some short-term needs in the physical environment. Um, you know, one of the things that we're, we're really encouraging folks to look at is workload management. Um, you know, typically we just have routine work orders we're kicking out and we've got people busy every day. Um, you really need to look at that right now for your physical environment as a whole. Um, because if people aren't looking at their workload management, it could really bite them pretty quickly. Uh, you know, you need to make sure your critical infrastructure, not only your mechanical systems, but your electrical systems, um, your medical gas systems that they're being taken care of. Uh, you know, one of the big things we did see when we were at full surge in certain areas, they were having issues with um, their medical, their bulk oxygen systems because of the fact that uh, they were having um, problems with uh, it freezing up on them. So uh, because the use was such a, a larger demand than they were normally having that they had the, the evaporators actually freezing up on them. So, you know, making sure you're watching your critical infrastructure is really important. And then of course, planning for demobilization of your implemented changes in the in the future. If we can go to the next section. Oh, sorry, forgot this one. Sorry about that, Jill. Um, so one of the big things that you need to take into short-term uh, considerations are your, are the social distancing aspects that are needed. Um, you know, and we've got a couple diagrams here on how to set up queuing. Uh, you know, we try to, one of the things we need to do is through administrative actions, to reduce queuing as much as we can. We don't want people standing in lines. That's a bad thing because people tend to get closer and closer to each other as the line moves. Um, so again, having, so reducing that's very important, but when you're setting up queuing, making sure that there's enough gaps in the way that the lines are set up so that people can keep their distance from each other. And then of course, waiting, we want to reduce all any waiting as much as we can, but in order to make sure that we're not uh, exposing uh, patients or visitors is by taking and actually removing seats if possible or blocking them off. So making sure that you're looking at establishing social distancing parameters is real important. Uh, let's go to that next section now on long-term needs. Thanks. Um, so in our long-term needs, uh, you know, some of the things we need to be looking at is documentation. We wanna make sure we're documenting the data for this, uh, 
So, you know, and not just for research or those kind of things, but for your response to it. Uh, you need to be taking and collecting the, the data, you know, how many man hours are being put into this? How many, uh, what labor, what different uh, trades are being impacted more than others? Um, making sure you're looking and analyzing the information you have is very important. Um, I, we are, ASHI is encouraging very strongly that you take and look at development of case studies. If you've got something that worked really well, please share that. Write that up. If you need help writing that up, contact us and we'll be glad to help with that. Um, and because that's the way we help everybody learn and we can develop those things and move, move forward and spread that information. And then a very important aspect also is developing strategic partnerships. You know, making sure that you're developing partnerships with uh, mechanical engineers that can help you with uh, setting up your systems properly, but also things like alternate care sites. Um, you know, there was the look at um, using hotels for moving patients to them um, and those kind of things. You know, once you're out of that pandemic surge and all of the, the emergency response mode is when you really want to be looking at establishing those strategic partnerships. You know, do you have a good enough partnership with your uh, liquid oxygen delivery system, uh, vendor so that you're getting liquid oxygen as often as you need during a pandemic of this nature? Next slide, Jill. A few other things, uh, and, and I'll go over these kind of quickly. You know, we need to look at some of the impact that this pandemic is going to have. We know it's impact telemedicine significantly. Um, it's also impact telework, you know, people working from home. So you may be able to take and extend some of that telework and take space that you have and use it, increase your waiting areas and that kind of stuff. So uh, looking at those things is very important. Again, I mentioned social distancing already and alternate care sites. Uh, you know, we know those are going to be used in the future. Um, it would be interesting to see how long social distancing stays around um, for it. You know, are we going to need to dedicate units and have negative pressure units for pandemics and those kind of things? Um, are there modifications you made to your mechanical systems that you should consider in a long-term process and actually get approval from your AHJ and, and establish those as permanent changes? Um, one of the things that we are very highly recommending is you look at what's known as ventilation pressure relationship plans. We call them VPRs. Um, just like we have life safety drawings that clearly indicate where our life safety barriers, our fire and smoke barriers, our hazardous rooms are, et cetera, why sh we are highly recommending that we should have ventilation pressure relationship plans that clearly indicate where your negative pressure rooms are, where your positive pressure rooms are, and those kind of things. Uh, you know, we've heard of situations where uh, they created negative pressure rooms around a positive pressure area and actually impacted the positive pressure area so much that it was that went negative on them. That's not the kind of stuff we want to be doing. So knowing where those relationships exist on a plan can help you prepare for those. Uh, I think we have one more slide in this section. A uh, couple things or a few things to recommend you do uh, getting prepared into doing the, the long-term stuff. Um, definitely need to look at your hazard vulnerability assessment. Um, you know, many organizations, uh, the last organization I worked for, we had pandemics listed in our HVA, but I assure you there's no way that we were ready for what we see now. I highly doubt any organization was ready. So updating your hazard vulnerability assessment so that it's properly completed for pandemics is very important, um, which will in turn put you in a position where you, you're gonna to wanna to update your emergency response plan. Um, make sure you're using some of the documentation from your after action reports, your AAR to to incorporate lessons learned from there into your emergency response plan. 
And then one other thing we'd like to encourage folks to look at is your, to evaluate your current capital plans. Um, you know, there's a, a, there's new norm folks. There's, it's different. So we need to look at our long-term capital planning to see what changes need to be made there. Let's quickly go over the ITM section. Uh, one of the things that was, that ASHI uh, advocated very strongly for was a waiver for inspection, testing, and maintenance. Um, because, you know, not only did we not have staff that could be dedicated to doing this at that time, but on top of that, we didn't want extra people in the facility because of exposure and those kind of things. So you couldn't actually bring outside uh, third party folks to come in and to test your your some of your systems such as your fire alarm so making sure that you document what was done or what was deferred not done was very important so we actually we put together we had a team put together a, a deferral documentation sheet um, and this is available on our um, website under our COVID-19 resources webpage free for anybody and everybody uh, that'll help you document this properly because we know when it comes to getting back to that new norm, there are going to be surveys. We need surveys. We, we want to be successful in our surveys. And the only way we'll be able to do that is make sure we have it thoroughly and properly documented. So that's what this is for. And with that, that wraps up what we had in regards, that, or I had to present in regards to what ashy has been doing. Great, Any thank questions? you. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, Doug, you wanna talk about what FGI is planning to do in terms of guidelines and some of the, your learnings over the last couple months and what you plan to do next. Sure, Donna, I'd love to do it from the Klingon bridge, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to run the slides or is uh, Jill going to turn it over to me? Uh, up, Jill, what do you want to do? There we go. Cool. All right. Well, uh, first of all, thanks everybody for allowing me to spend um, a couple of minutes with you this morning. Uh, we as the Facility Guidelines Institute have been charged by our board of directors to um, address the whole issue of not only of COVID, but really of emergency conditions and resiliency when it comes to weather, man-made, uh, looking at surge capacity, and I'll go through each one of these in a second. And so uh, we embarked upon something uh, of this order about April of this year. We've been spending quite a bit of time pulling together what the scopes should be of the various subcommittees and the people that are on the subcommittee. So if we go to the next slide, Joe. Uh, so what I'd like to cover right now, and there's a lot to cover, but I'm gonna spend very little time on each one of them. Um, it's really what we've done, where we are, and where we want to be, and some of our next steps. So next slide, Joe. As you can see, the committee, uh, we've got not only an executive committee, a steering committee made up of quite a few healthcare systems in there. So we've got the Indian Health Service, we have Trinity Health System, we've got uh, HCA, uh, UPMC, um, we of course have ASHI in, in there, Ascension. So our real goal here is to, for, to follow the same format as a standard uh, health guidelines revision committee and that is being multidisciplinary, but also wanting to make sure that we are not overstating the issues. And so we called, we invited in a lot of health organizations to keep us on track, to keep us from creating something that could be unmanageable. We have eight different subcommittees. Um, we have one looking at renovations and future uh, design considerations for facilities. We have weather and man-made rate related events and what the resiliency needs to be for that. A lot of discussion about whether or not man-made should be included. And it uh, just got off a call before this one. And the answer was absolutely, because there are man-made events that will stress your system. Uh, just as I'm 
example, the Las Vegas shooting, where most of the uh, victims and most of the uh, those needing uh, to be taken care of were transported to a facility called Sunrise. And they had to convert conference rooms into trauma rooms. They had to convert other spaces and cafeterias into areas where the general public was coming in and the loved ones of these individuals. Uh, once again, uh, looking at the stress of the systems in the physical environment is what we're really looking at. Surge capacity, we all know about surge. Uh, what happens when you do have a pandemic? What happens when you do have a need to stress that healthcare organization? The alternate care sites, as Jonathan was talking about, uh, looking at all of these different sites in which we have placed patients, whether they are convention centers, um, hotels, uh, arenas, whatever the case may be, the Army Corps of Engineers have some great guidelines. But what we're really looking at here are four different areas. Uh, the immediate need, okay, the temporary, semi-permanent, and permanent. Each one of those may have a completely different set of physical environment considerations. They may not all have to follow the FGI guidelines to the letter of the law, okay? So for an immediate facility or a, a semi-permanent facility, maybe we make some concessions. And those concessions, once again, go back to the authorities having jurisdiction so that uh, once we're all singing out of the same hymnal. Uh, small and rural healthcare, looking at the impact it has on these small Indian health service facilities, these small and rural critical access hospitals, and what do they need to be prepared for when an event happens. Modular construction, we all know a lot of tents were set up. A lot of uh, trailers were brought into place to do pre-admission uh, uh, pre testing or uh, staff screening. Uh, also, we're looking at modular construction uh, for uh, temporary airborne infection and isolation rooms. We're really trying to get our arms around where the modular uh, element comes in. We do not want to deal with tents and things that are set up very, very temporary uh, just in order to get uh, weather uh, concealed from the weather or an opportunity out of the sun, et cetera. Uh, operational considerations, and this is really an overriding uh, subcommittee. It's gonna be looking at the work of all the other subcommittees to make sure we're not getting into policy. We're not getting into telling hospitals how to do things, but what we're really doing is working on the physical environment to make sure that the tools are there. So if they do need to provide any of this, uh, oh, any, any new or different types of aspects in order to handle emergency condition, they're ready for it. I was talking to Dana Swenson this morning and I said, told him, I said, Dana, we're only 10% of the solution. But if we mess up that 10%, the whole solution comes down and, and fails. And then the last but not least is residential and senior living. We all know that we have not been doing a good job with the residential community. A lot of nursing home issues when it comes to not only weather related events, but the pandemic itself. So those are the eight uh, committees. We have about 145 people who are volunteering and have been asked to uh, serve on these committees. So I think we've got a really good cross-section uh, of multidisciplinary individuals. So next, our mission is very simple, create a white paper by the end of the summer. Uh, it's kind of been pushed back to October at this point. So late, late summer, early uh, fall. And then to uh, also pr uh, produce a guideline on emergency conditions by the 1st of 2022. We'll be releasing the other three documents, the hospital, the outpatient and residential uh, in January of 2022. The emergency conditions document will also be released at the same time. Now a little bit about this. So the white paper, we're taking the good, the bad, the ugly. We're doing a full vetting of the various solutions that were done on the fly in order to just address the COVID-19 issues. 
Um, but we're going to take our time to vet through them and um, come up with what we think are some of the best practices and make recommendations as to where what we do when we go uh, when we need to go further within the current event or within a new event that happens. Um, it's going to be interesting. I, I was kind of floored by the fact that we didn't have a federal plan on this. We had state authority having jurisdictions calling us saying, what do we do? We have no plan. We don't know how to evaluate all these modifications that are taking place in order to handle the influx of COVID-19 patients. Um, don't know where that's going to be. That's more of a Jonathan Flannery AHA uh, issue to handle as far as uh, will we have a single plan or will we have state plans or individual organizational plans from here on out. Next slide. So our timeline is such as I mentioned to have some white paper out by this one says September. It's been moved to October just because of the workload and then to have the actual guideline in place by the um, January 1st or thereabouts of 2022. Now, I didn't mention that the white paper, and here again, I'm just picking out numbers, but the white paper may be 2,000 pages in length because of all of the various solutions that are out there, where the actual guidelines themselves may be two pages. Okay, and so that's what we're going to struggle with as far as what goes into a standard that is mandatory versus what is more of a beyond fundamental best practice. Next slide. So the charge of the various subcommittees, you know, be thought leaders, um, really go through and collect what's being generated, look at what's being generated, come up with what is more of a fundamental versus a beyond fundamental and then really to generate the content uh, for this white paper and also for the uh, actual guideline itself. Next. Our data collection and anybody uh, that wants to help us with this, that's great, but really to um, see what's out there. We do not want to become another repository. ashy has been doing a great job of being a repository. The Center for Health Design the American Institute of Architects. A lot of these organizations have been collecting all these various documents that have been published, solutions that have been uh, applied, and uh, some attempts that have been made. I know that a lot of discussion about um, converting parking structures. I know Vanderbilt did it. I know Mercy here in St. Louis at, the Creve, at their Creve Core facility did it. Well, it was great when it was in April, but boy, as soon as it started to hit May and the tempers went up to 90 degrees, that parking structure became untenable. And by the way, they never did have a patient in it to begin with. And everything was made of plywood, uh, shortcutting a lot. We want to look at that. We want to see, was that a good solution? Wasn't it a good solution? And capture it and record it. Uh, next. We are going to use a white paper format that was very similar to the one that was used for um, on ideas of reshaping the emergency department for the future, looking at low acuity uh, uh, pods in the waiting spaces or low acuity waiting areas. Um, it's going to have the opportunity to put in the best practice, to put in a lot of narrative, to put in pictures, etc. But it will also have in there what we would consider recommendations for uh, the final guideline itself, uh, what would go in the into the body of the document versus the appendix. And then we're going to have a public review process. And that public review process is going to be about four to six months long. We're going to let the general public look at what we've done, what we're recommending, come back with um, comments to us so that we can put that into the process, make our various changes, and then also have that um, influence the results that would go into the final uh, actual mandatory document itself. Uh, so next slide. Right now, we still don't know if this will be a standalone document. 
whether it would be a supplement to the 2022 doc, uh, guidelines, in other words, reside on top of the hospital, the outpatient, and the residential, or whether it would be integrated into the 2022 as a chapter uh, within all three of those guidelines. Uh, most of the steering committee, executive committee, is pushing for it to be a standalone document, but at this point in time, it's not been resolved. So next. Uh, since we're talking about ventilation, uh, I gave this presentation to ASHRAE 170's committee a, a couple of weeks ago, and I just wanted to assure them that we're not trying to get into the 170's business. But what we do want to do is look at the major ventilation concepts. We want to look at things such as, are there needs for additional airborne infection isolation rooms as a result of this? Uh, do we need to be able to convert a standard uh, patient room from equal pressure to a negative pressure by using the building automation system or switch on the wall or anything such as that? Um, what, how, to what extent? Should there be recommendations on, is it 10% of your rooms, 20%, is it all your rooms? Don't know at this point in time. That's what we're really investigating. Um, and by the way, for those of you that are in the state of Florida, if there is anybody in the state of Florida, I understand that ACA, which is the state agency, is not permitting organizations to take patient rooms from an equal pressure or no, uh, no requirement to a negative pressure which is totally against the 170 requirements. You can have a standard patient room at positive, equal, or negative. It really doesn't matter. There is no requirement for uh, standard patient room pressurization. There is a requirement, of course, for air changes per hour, for temperature, humidity, et cetera, but nothing for having the, uh, for the pressurization. And then also looking at alternate uh, site mechanical system expectations. You know, when you talk about all these portable systems, uh, I happen to be involved with the Joplin uh, Replacement Hospital, and we put the modular unit up that was going to last for three years. And you had all of these rooftop air handlers. We must have had 100 or 200 of them up there. What happens to those? How difficult are they to maintain? What if they did have another huge windstorm? Would they actually have survived? Um, but all of these elements are things that we are looking at. As Jonathan mentioned about waiting rooms, I was on a call, the Ben call yesterday, and the day before we talked about, do you even need waiting rooms any longer? A lot of organizations, the people are actually staging in their automobiles, in their cars, and then coming in as the exam rooms as there are the procedure rooms are being made available. But is that sustainable? Do you want to have all those cars idling? And what's the effect on the entire, the total environment as a result of people sitting in cars in 90 degree, 95 degree temperatures? Very interesting when you think about it. What is the social distancing? Where are the sneeze guards going to go? How are we going to really put pro a process in place in order to uh, accommodate those folks that are coming into our healthcare facilities. Telehealth is another one that we addressed in 2018. Um, and a lot of folks, they may have gone from five telehealth visits within their organization to 20,000 a day, almost overnight. Uh, we have to evaluate not only the telehealth at the organization itself, or if it's being done from the physician's um, basement, like I'm sitting in my basement right now, actually I'm on the Klingon bridge, but I'm in my basement. Um, and what kind of requirements are we going to be forcing upon organizations for not only those that are within the four walls of the organization, but in the remote offices of these physicians doing the telehealth. There's a lot of issues there with color, of the backgrounds with glare, with lighting, with acoustics, with, I mean, you name it, you've got it. And we got to make sure that the quality of these uh, facilities or these spaces are such that they're not going to impair the actual outcome of the interview, outcome of the diagnosis. 
Um, so lots of things that are going on. Uh, next slide. You know, we are next steps. We're just in the really the collection and scoping at this point in time. For those of you that are wondering what that picture is on the bottom right hand, that is a wheelhouse. All right, you got clocks, you got storage units, you get, but so it's within our wheelhouse to do this or outside of the wheelhouse. Well, they've actually uh, made a, uh, a space out of it. And so uh, once again, we're, um, we're on our way trying to create something that will be meaningful to all of you, will be able to be used by the authorities having jurisdiction, and um, will give you some advanced insight as to what should be done when we have these weather and man-made events. So next slide. Or was that the final slide there, Jill? Probably was the final slide. So Donna? That's that, the final I'll, slide. Yep, with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Donna. Okay, great. All right. Thank you, uh, Jim, Jonathan, and Doug. Um, and now, it really, it's time for questions from, from the health facilities. What'd you think? Comments, thoughts? I thought the presentation was great, all of them. Everyone did a great job. Good, good. Can we get a copy of the slides? Yes. Good. Yeah, it's, it's Jeff. I think um, thanks to John and everybody, uh, I think they did a great job. Doug, I'm interested about the emergency management stuff a lot. So um, let me know if you need anything. We're doing a lot of stuff here, but all great stuff today. Thank you. Great. Questions? Um, let's, uh, well, we'll start with Jim. Anybody have any questions about, you know, we talked about the idea of trying to understand the science behind ventilation. Uh, was there anything that Jim uh, presented that was a surprise or do you have questions about anything that he talked about? Uh, I might, go ahead. I just wanna ask Jim, I, I got into a situation, uh, I've, I'm now in Lifeport Health, uh, not at TIFF anymore and and one thing what Jim was talking about the UVC is yes, after that, after we worked with Jim on that, became a spec throughout uh, any air handle change out from that point on. But, um, but I've got into a situation, uh, one of the DPOs or DFMs, what somebody call, uh, and this, this is outside of healthcare, he, he called me and asked the question is, he said his church was wondering, they shut the air system down uh, because they were going back. And, and, and the congregation, and it kind of set me up. Like, I mean, I wasn't about to tell him that you need to shut your air system down. I told him I prefer him not to, but uh, that was very good. The presentation you did, Jim, was great. I mean, because that, that actually was a question that was posed to me. I mean, he was just looking for help and what, what their church service would look like if they had shut. I said, it's going, your whole area is just going to overheat with that many people in there. So, um, like I said, I don't know if anybody, I mean, I think this from the healthcare facility, I mean, we, we're trying not to gather a lot of people anyways, but uh, this situation could come up. So what's, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I, I certainly would not say shut down the air handling system. Um, okay. that, that one example of the, um, the restaurant in China, the, the key to that one is that it was, it was the, the, the pattern of air distribution blowing across those people that caused a problem. Um, but in general, if an air handling system is moving air, and particularly if it's bringing in some outside air, you're improving the dilution. Uh, if you don't have an air, air handling system at all, you do have sort of a natural convection current. But the most important part is none of that has anything to do with droplets and droplets transmission is the primary mode and air handling systems can't solve that. It's possible for them to make it worse, but they can't solve it. Uh, you know, face covering, social distancing, small crowds are, are the keys there, not, not ventilation. Sure. And if, if I could jump in on that just a little bit, uh, I'm part of the epidemiology, epidemiology task force for ASHRAE. Um, their position paper, the first paragraph tells you 
do not shut systems down. Um, ventilation systems do filtration. They do move the air, which is a dilution process. So you definitely want them on. You do need to make sure that they're working properly and that they're functioning the way they should. And then if you can increase the outside air based on the environment outside, whether it's too hot, too cold or whatever, um, that would be a good, good thing. Uh, to that point on air handlers, um, uh, you know, air handlers are good. They do good things for us. But to the point, uh, they got to be maintained. And healthcare hospitals, I'm not as concerned about, but you go in restaurants and other areas, they have no idea what this equipment is half the time. If you're ever to look inside it or, or uh, look under the hood, you're going to find some pretty nasty stuff uh, in that system or on those coils and so forth. And, and, and you can't tell me, uh, especially some of these that have, you know, plug drains and condensate pans and things like that, that they are breeding all kinds of wonderful uh, potential pathogens uh, on these air handling units. Yeah, Mark, to that point, that's one of the reasons I thought that for an alternate care site, these hotels, very poor choice with the PTAX and everything else. I mean, my goodness, who knows the last time they got in there to uh, maintain those systems. It's very true. I was in a, a Fairfield. Uh, I turned on the PTAC and I don't get sick. And I was sick within 45 seconds, I'd say. Oh, it was just loaded, I can tell you. Oh. A, couple, a couple other questions. Um, maybe they're more comments, but uh, so we hear a lot about PCO, you know, photocatalytic uh, oxidation. Um, I think uh, I think Jim, you know, uh, hit the nail on the head with it. But we hear so much about it, and it's the saving grace to everything out there that has to do with air. And and from my observation of it, it may do something, but it doesn't solve the world's problems. And if it does anything, Jim, it's probably the reduction of uh, VOCs or odors in the air, and probably not a whole lot more. Uh, there is there is claim that it does affect um, um, living organisms as well. So maybe it helps. I, I really, if I was in the business of selling PCO systems or bipolar ionization, I'd be looking for some real research. I would be having some real research done scientifically studies, not just the commission lab laboratory studies that are being done because here's your opportunity. I mean, if you have, if you have a bipolar ionization system in, or a PCO system and you've done the research and it's effective against these kind of things, you, you, you're going to sell opportunities right. to sell more than you can take. And yet they're not out there. Um, now, and, on and the other hand, go ahead. And if I may, Ashy has reached out to many of those organizations and offered to partner with them to do that in space research, actual in facility research. No takers, folks. None. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Now, now on the other have, hand, you may I have told a UV person that's willing to do it, but I haven't been able to get them to sign on the dotted line yet. Yeah. If I owned, if I was the manager of a commercial office building and I was trying to convince my tenants to come back in. I'd probably install a bipolar ionization system, the, the one that had the best brochures, and do my best to sell it as, you know, I've done everything I can do. Um, but that doesn't cut it in health facilities we, where, where we're supposed to know better. So specifically with bipolar ionization, uh, what I've seen, what I've read, uh, again, suggests it might do something, but the something may be more about pulling the particles out of the air getting them to uh, stick to your walls and curtains and, and other uh, uh, materials in the room, not necessarily doing any eradication of the particles or potential pathogens. Yeah, and, and I'm not sure of the value of having those things stick to our surfaces. Sure, sure. There, there, there is no value. It becomes counterproductive after a while. 
Jim, Jim Gross. Uh, actually, I'm with Mark. I'm in one of uh, the affiliates of the university. And I'm on my day off, I might add. <laughs> uh, however, this looked to be something I couldn't miss. And I have to tell you, all of you, uh, Jonathan, Jim, Don, others who spoke, best doggone hour I've ever spent. Thank you so much. Um, so observation done. Um, I'm not sure I'd travel on an airplane without a full, um, full face respirator. Uh, given the potential for transmission to the eye, which is the least discussed um, portal for entry um, and the most overlooked. Uh, I think we need to spend a little bit more time educating the public on that. I think we've got the mass thing there, but I think the public doesn't understand the difference between protecting others and protecting themselves vis-a-vis -vis an N95 respirator if you're vulnerable um, if you're out in public, as opposed to uh, three-ply mask. Anyhow, enough of that. So, Jim, if you had to choose, and I think you may have just said it, between the systems that's going to have the greatest effectiveness of those that are out there, what would be your choice for filtering the air? I would use HEPA filtration. Hands down, no question. In, in my view, Air that passes through a HEPA filter is clean air. Um, it's cleaner than the outdoor air you're bringing in. Sure. It's cleaner than the outdoor air you bring in and run through a, a MER 14. Yes. It is clean. So I have no hesitation sending he properly, he properly HEPA filtered air back into the, into the building or into the air handling system. The key there is the proper filtration. Um, you know, a lot of these portable units that we're using, how tightly does the filter seal? Uh, did the filter get kicked? Uh, is it really a filter anymore? Um, in, in an air handling system, you can't just run HEPA filters into the rack designed for uh, MER-14s. It needs to be a properly designed rack, properly installed, uh, tested. Any bypass error around that filter is more risk. Now, that, in, that, that sort of assumes that there's a significant risk. And the science says there's not a, a, a significant risk in the air handling system. On the other hand, if we're doing, uh, I, I'm doing a project right now with a client where we're, they have a, essentially an ICU that, that we are grabbing the return air, going up to the roof, running through a HEPA filter booster fan back down into the building and tie back to the return system. Um, those are not going to be full blown airborne infectious isolation rooms because they're, it's an ICU with those sliding doors and gaps all over the place. And we're not going to no, there's no way we're going to maintain a specific pressure. Uh, so we're not going to call it an AI room, but there's, this is an ICU set, setting where uh, aerosol generating procedures are the norm. Uh, there's a lot of information about uh, aerosolization that occurs with, uh, with different kinds of ventilators. And we just have to assume that aerosols are being generated there and probably in enough concentration that we need to do something about it. So uh, the science doesn't say it's an absolute, but the client certainly is going to feel better doing this. So that's what we're doing. And HEPA filters are the way to go. I wouldn't, I wouldn't fool around with anything else. Yeah, yeah. great, great. Jim, I sit Doug, on, I Jim, sit on. This is Doug. I just want to say the nice thing about this is that the technology, as Jim mentioned before, with regards to the Delta P across that filters, filter bank, is such that we're not going to get any volume loss. So I think it's absolutely the right way to go is to redesign or design the system for the health of filtration at this point. Thanks, Doug. Uh, Jim, observation, I'm in the same half of the inning 
with you when it comes to filtration. I sit on Jonathan's advocacy uh, committee, and Jonathan knows I've been beating the bandwagon about filtration being more than just the filter. It's actually a system. And the filter racks in our hospitals uh, in general, I would submit 90% of them are seeing bypass around the edge of the filter. And we need to do more to address um, the uh, system as a whole, either in code or in language or regulation, uh, than simply stating that a, a MERV 14 or 95% uh, uh, efficient filter is gonna be adequate. Uh, many uh, of the Jim, folks don't, don't understand the bypass issue. Yeah, Jim, if I may though, if you remember, we did something in the code and then found out that ASHRAE, one, ASHRAE ASHI 170 totally addresses this issue. We need to do more in compliance. There you go. Making sure that it's being done yeah. properly yeah. by the manufacturer. Yeah, I, I was on a- the Code requires it. I was at a hospital uh, that shall be unnamed uh, last week and I was looking at a final filter housing that I believe was installed in the mid 60s. Now, what are the chances that that side access filter housing um, is getting a good tight seal on the MERV 14s? I think it's pretty slim. It probably wasn't good when it was new. Yeah. Actually, Jim, if I may, I would suggest that it's actually getting better seals than the ones that are being created in 2017 and 18. Wow. <laughs> it's just I'm not, the construction I'm not sure back I'm then. God, I'm not sure I'm with you on that one, Jonathan. <laughs> I, I've got 73 vintage uh, facilities, and I know exactly what Jim's talking about. That's why I'm specifying knife edge uh, filter uh, rack assemblies with gel uh, seal. Gel at the, seal. Yeah, at the edge. You can't get any better. As long as the knife edge doesn't get damaged as things are being exactly. replaced. Yeah, yeah, so, which yeah. means you have to have really good access to the upstream side of those filters so that yeah. they're not getting banged around. Uh, we, for years, we did a lot of air handling units with side access filter housings. And you know, you're depending on a gasket with a filter sliding past, maybe five filters sliding past that gasket and it's supposed to maintain its integrity. And, yeah, so what are those metal it? pieces do? Those metal pieces are sitting on top of the air handler. I can't tell you how many surveys I've That's been. right. And the metal pieces are sitting up there going, you know, they belong in there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, they didn't, didn't fit that. or, uh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Lots of opportunity for improvement. Yeah. Okay. Any, any specific questions about um, rooms or places um, for negative air? You know, I know one of the reasons that um, we even set up this educational session is that people had a lot of questions about how much negative air do I need to provide? Uh, where do I need to do it? Um, do I need to do it in other rooms, operating rooms? exam rooms, et cetera. What a, what a, that's still an issue or a question amongst you guys? I thought Jim's presentation regarding modeling was particularly interesting. To go from scatter throughout the room to a linear path to the ceiling uh, diffuser above was incredible. In fact, almost unbelievable, Jim. Well, I, 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 that is a really key point there. Don't, don't get too caught up in that because that's an idealized model, of sure. course. And having, yes. having another person in the room, having someone walk past, the, you know, air currents air are currents. so just, fluid. Just having a patient in the room and their body heat. Well, yes. Yeah. Well, that but, is, but yeah. that's a key. That's a really good point, Jonathan, because that's one thing that that system actually sort of acknowledged is a patient lying on his back, breathing up, the natural convection current carries it. If the return's right there, that's great. Current, current, current. Now, if the patient's on his side yep. and coughs in that direction, it will not be as, as exactly. clean as that. 
But the general idea of thinking about these systems as a way to Im improve the dilution ratio, essentially. <laughs> but also, I would say that CFD is has gone from a very expensive, highly specialized art form to something that we can do on a uh, not quite routine basis, but pretty close to it. Uh, we, we just did a model for the World Health Organization. They, they have this tent facility that they're setting up for, um, for WHO staff who are out in the field and get sick. They're gonna bring them to this facility in Ghana. And uh, the, there was a company that sort of put this together and they actually had set up the returns below the bed in the head in the head wall tent wall of the of the tent and we looked at that and said hmm i wonder why that's there and they asked us to do the do some modeling and we did and of course the answer was down below the bed isn't doing any good um, but the, the very simple thing of raising that uh exhaust grill three feet one meter excuse me not feet one meter uh higher made a huge difference in the um, the particle tracing and just the general airflow in those in those stalls this wasn't even a you know it's just open stalls in a tent um, and and the modeling was able to demonstrate that and we actually there were a couple of things that were not intuitive and that's the key to cfd we ventilation engineers have been doing this by the seat of our pants for a uh, long, long time, and now we can do some modeling that, while not perfect, uh, tells us a little bit more about what's really going to happen when we make these changes. Yeah, me, Jim, maybe I can ask about that. I, I, I'm not that fam familiar with CFD modeling, but, you know, earlier, I think Jonathan talked about the need to get data, and, and Doug's looking for that as well. Are there specific things that you're recommending that people try to do as they're trying to think about, you know, going forward and setting up sy systems? Should they do more modeling? How hard is that to do? I, this is a very recent thing that, that this has become so readily available, I think. Uh, so it's not been really incorporated into the workflow of, uh, of the design process just generally, there, are, there might be a specific question. And I, and I was realizing when I looked at that, that image on those patient rooms, I, I don't know how many design projects I've done where the team got together to design the perfect patient room. I don't know how many perfect patient rooms there are out there, but there, there are a number of teams that have worked hard to figure it out. And in all cases, the ventilation system was not really part of that process because you know we just kind of do what we know to do and i'm realizing based, especially based on that that uh, that is something we should pay attention to even in just a normal patient room especially if we're doing a couple hundred of them or even 20 of them uh, there's no reason we can't do cfd modeling now to to look at what's the be what's a better way to do it given the configuration of the room uh, will it be perfect no but it's likely to be better and I'll take better any day. Yeah, well, Jim, you need to talk with Donna further about that because the center is working with the University of Utah to look at the perfect single bedded room. Now, uh, <laughs> As opposed to the previous perfect single bedded room. Uh, yes. Well, it's taking all of the various examples that have been out there that claim to be perfect, and uh, we are looking at all of those uh, solutions. Some of the cool. things that CFD has to take into consideration though. Family zones, window placement, okay? Yep. The placement of the uh, bathroom, inboard, outboard, with the swinging door, sliding door. So many things that have to come into, variables that have to come into that CFD model where you don't have that straight, right from the patient's mouth into the exhaust system. Yeah. Um, I've looked at CFD models since uh, NIH was doing it with Farhad back when right. um, when uh, MDR TB came out, and he could actually model the TB molecule and how it bounced off of walls, ceilings, floors. Pretty interesting stuff. But it yeah, is. we have to make sure we get it right. I agree with you. It, we we have to make sure we get it as good as we can. There you go. 
Yes. Within reason. Agreed. Yep. Hey, Doug, it's uh, Jim. I can't miss this opportunity at a little bit of fun. Don't let Larry Rubin in your basement. You got a missing ceiling tile. Oh, and I Larry know. <laughs> okay. All right, Jim, let me explain to you what that missing ceiling, why it's missing. It's because I bought the house eight years ago and they had, they have this man cave, they've done this. And there was no, there was no um, supplies. Okay, supply duct coming in. And I saw what the heck's going on? Well, they just cut, there's a supply there, right there coming out of the duct, but they covered it up with the ceiling. So oh I had to take the tiles down. <laughs> Will that be acceptable, Larry, as a defense? <laughs> no. Too late, they already ordered it up. He's already in trouble. <laughs> yeah. already on it. Well, it's interesting. Somebody mentioned, I think it was Mark, the condensate, okay? And in the drip pans and everything else. Well, if I turn my camera over here, I've got a floor that is wet because my condensate line clogged up on me. So I'm working on that one, too. Hey, <laughs> hey Doug. Hey, hey Doug. Uh, this is your lucky day, Doug. Uh, Vicki Franklin, who's on the line, she's been with Granger for about 20 years. She, she actually introduced the uh, catalog, introduced ceiling tiles to Granger when we did not offer them 10 years ago. So if you can... <laughs> Get a measuring tape and get your specifications. She can get you get you a part number. We can have that to you by tomorrow morning. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just yeah. teasing. Quick, quick question for you. Um, going back to um, Jim's comment with the safety glasses and exposures in the air, um, I was just curious how many hospitals out there. Uh, I know there's a couple of hospital health systems in Philadelphia had a lot of exposures people not wearing enough, enough eye protection. Not Packers, but if a patient is decompensates and all of a sudden they go into a code um, and then they come back later, they were COVID positive. Uh, I was just curious what some other, other, like Larry and other people are doing with eye protection and stuff with the staff. It's so the here. reason, uh, Jeff, that I mentioned that is I've offered that to our facility staff and about half wear them. Um, I've encouraged them to wear them when it's unavoidable um, at keeping the uh, six feet um, spread. And that occasionally happens. I'm seeing some compliance, but not as much as I'd like to see. Yeah, it was just, um, we, we I, my little side project turned into to be a health system project now. Um, you know, I bought a lot of safety glasses uh, from Granger, Air Gas, and a couple others just to be able to fill the void. Um, you're going to laugh, but I, pro I probably bought so far 35000 um, oh for the health system, uh, as well as goggles. Um, so just to make sure that everyone has uniformity, it's just for patient care areas only. Um, and um, I, I, feel like, I feel like I'm Granger on the side of side distribution. Uh, mm -hmm you know, work with Bonnie and Ashley and everything, but it's just, um, um, it's just, I was just curious because um, we, we, it, was, it happened early on in COVID for us and we were very successful. Um, and it's just, I was just curious after your comment here and that. Yeah. You know, you know where this, where this came from was the, um, one of the doctors <clears throat> volunteered in New York City on the free flight back to wherever, Chicago, um, Subsequent to that flight, he contracted the virus mm -hmm. and he attributed the flight uh, and the lack of eye protection and how packed the flight was to um, having contracted it. And, and I thought, my gosh, we're just not putting enough effort toward getting that out in the public's eye. Yeah, hey, Jeff, Jeff, if yeah. I can find it, there is an article talking about the fact that using face shields up yeah, against yeah. masks is even is actually better. Now yep. the other factor is remember you touch your eyes, nose, and mouth over two thousand times a day. Yeah. Okay. And y y there you go. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that you can go on to uh, the and Google the New England Journal of Medicine. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's a it's called Stay Healthy. And it's actually somebody just saying, stay healthy. 
with and without a mask. And they have used a laser particle counter to show the amount of particulate coming out of the mouth when you say up against wearing a mask, which was zero. Those are what you need to be showing staff and others that don't yep. believe that a mask can be <laughs> a real big help. Yeah, we, I mean, masks are mandatory uh, for everyone here in the state. And uh, I mean, we, um, we bought, a, again, a ton of PPE, just like everyone else, you know, we use the face shields, um, when in doubt, if, you know, for anybody who's COVID positive or, you know, we have all the huddle sheets, everyone's done our great training and everything, all the other health systems are probably the same thing. But you're, you're right. I mean, the face shield with the mask is a way better level of protection. Uh, the, safety got, the safety glasses were just another level of protection. doesn't interrupt anything we've worked on for the last, I think, 16 weeks now and counting, um, you know, with this pandemic. So I was just curious. But thanks for that article, though. I'll read it. Thank you. And again, as Jim and Jim both mentioned, masks protect others. They don't protect you. Respirators protect you. Actually, I, I, I mentioned this in the, the Ben meeting uh, a few days ago, but there's a there's an article by Atul Gawande in the in at New Yorker about the work that they've done, and he he talks about the four things that all have to work together to provide protection, and he considers the the health system of the country basically the model for how to how to be at work because the health you know, health system never stopped, right? Uh, everybody else went home, but the health healthcare system had to keep going. Uh, and yet there haven't been all that many infections. Uh, so he talks about those four things. Um, and I'm not going to be able to repeat them all, but, but masks actually provide a little bit of protection for, for me if I'm wearing just even a, just a cloth mask. It's a little bit of protection, but yes, it's mostly about everybody else. So Doug, I think, I think that article you're referring to needs to get sent to every American, or at least every Georgian. I, you know, <laughs> I, I know Georgians need, need to read it, um, but um, the, the fifth element of the, of the uh, protection that Gawande writes about is culture and creating a culture where we pay attention to these things, we take care of other people, we do all the things that we need to do, and we call people out when they're not doing them. And uh, that's a culture that I don't really expect to see in the general public anytime soon, but at least here in our in healthcare facilities. Here in Missouri, they'd pull a gun on you. We have had people pull guns on people who have said, why aren't you wearing a mask? And they said, why don't you get out of my face? It's poor culture. It's just that's Missouri. Yeah, that's Missouri, all right. Um, hey, hey, Doc, I just want to make sure I got the, uh, the, the journal. Um, can you right. mention the journal, the journal and the article, at least on, on the Granger side, we definitely have the way with some tools and technology uh, to help get the word out within our networks uh, using LinkedIn and some other Granger means. So could you repeat that journal again? In, in well, it's the New England Journal of Medicine. Okay. And it is, if you just Google and say, stay healthy. Stay healthy, okay. Okay, and if you need to, Kim, I can send you the link. Uh, I can send it to Donna and send it to you. Awesome, thank you. Great, yeah, and we'll get the um, Atul Gawande article out to everybody as well, because. Um, that's a good one too, that Jim referenced. That and was Donna, great. Yeah, yeah, Donna, please be sure to get the uh, slide decks out to us. Yes. Jim's first several slides were of great interest. Great, we'll do. Yep, we'll, uh, uh, we, we'll get them from Jim and then we'll put them in the, the Dropbox. I think we need to take a moment and thank Larry for protecting us all right now. <laughs> hey, Larry. You didn't want a gun pulled on me. <laughs> I got a whole team here waiting for me. We're going. Jim, uh, let me ask you a question. And this may be a dumb question for everybody, but I, I just, I've always thought of it. Is there, have been, is there been any systematic approach or any kind of studies done on will heat kill this COVID? Or? Um. I'm trying to remember if I've seen studies about temperature with COVID specifically, 
but generally speaking for all of these viruses and um, and bacteria as well, temperatures high enough to kill are pretty bad for humans too. Yeah. So, yeah. so it, it might, you know, it might, it might be an effective means of sterilization, that sort of thing, but just in terms of air handling ventilation, we're not going to be able to achieve temperatures that are effective. You know, Florida right now is running 95 to 98 degrees every day. Our rate has gone out of sight. So if the sun is going to help or the heat's going to help, we're not seeing it. Not seeing yeah. it. Perfect. I, I know Jim has some slides about specific rooms if people have questions about um, specific room setups um, and I'm, he's happy to sh show those if, if, if people are interested. Sure. Any, any particular interest in any of that? I had told him to wait on that. Um, <laughs> just so we could get through the presentation. Well, these, Donna, are these slides that we have not seen? Right. They are, yes. Oh. Oh, yeah. Um, we'll certainly include them in the deck, but um, I'll stay another few minutes if you want to breeze through them. You guys want to look at them? Sure. I got, I got to run for a tour, but uh, please send them all to us. We appreciate it. He's coming okay. to your house, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. Bye, Larry. Yeah. Bye, Bye, Larry. So let me see here. My view change. Donna. Oh, there we go. Donna, yeah. if I may, real quick, if it's all right, I'm going to drop off also. Okay. Yeah, Jonathan, thanks. And again, if anyone has, uh, well, everybody on this call knows how to get in touch with me. So jflannery at aha.org, if you have questions, uh, just let me know. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye, Jonathan. You bet. Bye, Jonathan. Thanks. Bye, Jonathan. Bye. Thanks. So I'll just kind of breeze through these, and uh, if there are any questions, we can, we can talk about it. Emergency departments, we mostly have uh, a lot of these rules in place already. So waiting rooms are exhausted, there are 12 air changes, they're negative. Uh, AI rooms are where we do AGPs, so um, aerosol generating procedures. So um, you need to have a few of those obviously in your, in your EDs, you probably do already. Um, exam rooms are uh, generally only six air changes there's no requirement about pressurization there, uh, but it is, as Doug pointed out earlier, there's no uh, prohibition against running those exam rooms negative all the time. Um, and in this environment, that might be a fine thing to do. Um, the exam room is potentially where you're gonna put that patient where you are, uh, you suspect a person under investigation, someone you suspect might be infected. Um, that's a room with a door. So uh, it doesn't have, doesn't generally have toilet facilities, but it's a room with a door. Uh, so that might be where they end up because you're going to save your uh, AI rooms for other things. Uh, trauma rooms are a question that came up on a, a conversation I was having with a client where we're designing a new ED uh, or expanding the ED. And uh, there was a conversation about trauma rooms. Trauma rooms generally are, are held positive, sort of like an OR, emergency operating room. Um, but aerosol generating procedures are performed in a trauma room. And does it make sense to keep them positive? And generally they're, they're kind of wide open as well. Um, so one of the things we're talking about is do we need to make an anti room for the trauma room so that the trauma room can be protected from what's going on in the general area, but the general area can be protected from what's going on in the trauma room. Um, another thing we're talking about in this particular case is just going to full HEPA filtration for all the air systems in the emergency department. And and Jim, uh, uh, just a comment and observation. We talk about HEPA, but I don't think we talk about, uh, we don't talk enough about um, a filter challenge uh, when this device is put in use and a read at the discharge. And unfortunately, the only, uh, most of the 
particle counters are so doggone expensive. Um, it would be it would be wonderful if somebody could come up with a relatively inexpensive counter and the ability to challenge these on a regular basis because that filter is only as good as its ability to capture. And without having the uh, testing, you don't know. You don't know every time you change it or, or bump yeah. them or whatever. Yeah, you, you're, you're at risk. I, I will say particle counters are getting less expensive. There are some now that are, um, that are really quite cheap, but they're, they're large particles. They're not small particle counters. So as so, you get so, finer and finer, they're still pretty expensive. So Kim, there's your charge. Um, find us, find us uh, something that um, we can we can use as that tool that doesn't kill our budget. Um, operating rooms. There's a real question whether operating rooms need anything, um, they, but they are positive pressure rooms, so there's potential for what happens in there to leave the room, right? Uh, so. If you're doing aerosol generating procedures like an intubation, um, or it, I was looking at one where they were they were talking about doing brain surgery, and brain surgery to me means there's going to be some aerosolization of of uh, human tissue. So um, what we're what we're doing with one client because they want to do this, even though the science doesn't say they really have to, is we are uh, HEPA filtering the return from the OR and we are putting in place an ante room and initially it was, a, it was a temporary and now we're looking to actually make them permanent so that we capture what comes out of the OR because it's under, under positive pressure, capture that in the ante room, filter it and deliver it back to the, to the space. The counter to that is we already have a very high dilution rate in, in a, an OR, 20 air changes generally, it's a pretty large room um, is it really necessary? Um, science suggests maybe it isn't, but uh, I don't know that we can say for sure that it isn't. ICUs, this is a place where I think we really do need to pay attention. Um, most ICU rooms are neutral. Uh, actually in California, I believe the, the code there has required them to be positive uh, for some time. So even more of a concern. Um, but aerosol generating procedures happen in an ICU. The, the CDC guidance says that uh, AGPs should be done in an AII room. Well, no one is going to transfer the patient from the ICU to an AII room, do the procedure, and then bring them back. It's just It's just not going to happen. So we have to acknowledge that AGPs are going to happen in these ICU rooms. Uh, if not even in general population rooms, but at least in the ICU, and we need to treat them as such. So right now, uh, no directional control is required. Uh, there are six air changes. Um, we are working with a number of clients, as I, I think I mentioned, to, uh, to convert them to negative airflow, but no, no guarantee of, of an actual pressure differential or a measurable pressure differential. So, Jim, just uh, another observation. Uh, I've been doing healthcare all my life, a very, very long time. And I would submit that there truly isn't uh, a neutral room. If the wind uh, against the, Doug, you're shaking your head. You're muted, Doug. Which no, is... I'm, agreeing, I'm agreeing with you, Jim. There okay. is not, no, there is not. But, yeah. Right. A simple door closure, Jim. Um, yep. A difference in the uh, in the wind direction outside the building. Um, I don't think that neutral should be a qualifier or um, on our ASHRAE guidelines. It's just it doesn't exist. So well, Jim, Jim I, if I can if I can jump in, I've got the guidelines open right now. We've made some significant changes over the years. If you looked at the old AIA guidelines, and then before then, the old public health service guidelines, they actually had an E in there for equal. Equal, yeah. Okay, so over the years, we've changed that to a no requirement in NR, oh. simply because there's no way to keep an equal requirement within these rooms. You're right. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Good. Exactly. It, it, please note the, the terminology I used, no directional control. Yeah. Um, and, and actually, that Doug, it's interesting because, as you know, a number of jurisdictions have taken taken that equal to mean it absolutely has to be equal all the time. Uh, not that it ever is, but that you know it has to be balanced equal all the time. And in in the California Code, until I believe until this year, maybe last year, uh, the California Mechanical Code required constant volume systems so that you guaranteed that the air balance was the air balance or you had to have control over the return air and in a patient room. Um, same, thing hey. held true, same thing held true here in Missouri. Really? Up until they adopted the 2014 guidelines, they were requiring equal. We also used to have in there an N for neutral. Yeah. Okay. And that's why we've gone, uh, Jim, to the no requirement saying it could be anything you want. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hey, yeah, hey thought, Jim. Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, continue your thought, but uh, just real quick. Uh, AG for the for the non-engineer lay people like myself. Uh, AGP. Uh, can you define what that is? I may have missed sorry. that in the context. That's okay. Aerosol generating procedure. Wow. Oh. oh. Okay. Okay. Makes I, sense. I, so I, many acronyms in everybody's I'm world. Sorry. That makes yeah. sense. Okay. I heard my say. I heard myself say an AII with an AGPs, and I thought, yeah. oh, I hope everyone got that. Yeah. I, th uh, I guess air guard. But I, yeah. Aerosol okay. generating yeah. procedures, uh, intubations, yes. uh, yep. sometimes yeah. just being on a ventilator is an aerosol generating. Yep. Talking, talking, talking. Well, okay. singing, singing. Well, yeah, take the, yeah. the choir in Washington State. Right. Um, oh, yeah. Right. right. And, and if you've been around uh, professional singers, you know that um, there's a lot of droplets spewing out when they're yeah. singing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just look at, you know, watch a video of a singer making a video. They've got to have the, the spit guard in front of the yeah. microphone. Right. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, I, whereas I'm a much, I'm a much more a safer singer. I, I, I sing kind of softly and, and no one's ever <laughs> going to hear me. So I, I don't project droplets. <laughs> um, <laughs> just general inpatient units. Um, Typically, you're, uh, you only have one or two airborne infectious isolation rooms um, in, uh, in a typical inpatient unit. Everything else is um, a standard patient room uh, where there is no requirement for directional control of airflow. Um, the, the minimum air change rate is four air changes per hour now, two air changes of outside air. Um, a lot of folks have gone in and modified their patient rooms for a COVID unit to make them negative. And in fact, I'm working with a client right now to, to get rid of the little portable HEPA filter units they've had in place and make a permanent change to make their patient rooms negative. Is so that Jim, another question. I, I did, I, and again, this comes from experience. I don't see how you can just make the rooms negative on demand, short of having some sophisticated air valves on the supply and return that you have absolute control over. Right, and in this case, what we're talking about doing is installing an exhaust system and the rooms will always be negative. Sure. So we're just gonna modify the air balance. We're gonna uh, make the rooms negative, increase the exhaust or, or uh, HEPA filter it. And so curious, um, in, those, in that client's uh, room, are you going to put a slot return diffuser above the head of the bed to kill a couple of birds? Um, the, I just want to be clear, the, the slot was the supply, but yeah, there was a, large, a larger return grill above the head of the bed. I don't know if we're going to be able to make that modification or not. If, if I get to put a new return grill in, yes, that's where I'm going to put it. I was sort of baiting the conversation with the use of the term slot. It would seem to me that slot might accommodate that patient turning their head uh, and not being directly uh, beneath and looking up toward, and that that might help in that modeling that you did, or at least go in the direction of more You're control. just thinking because of the high velocity? And yeah. Going in. That actually, that, that's a really important thing when you're discharging from a diffuser, that high velocity makes a big difference because that can throw the air across the room. 
but on the return or exhaust side, the velocity at the, at the intake has only a very, very local effect. The, uh, because you can't, sucking right here doesn't impart momentum to particles that are over there. They have to be within, they have to be on their way to it. It can change the overall general pattern of airflow, but high velocity, low velocity at the grill doesn't really have much effect in the room. So translated, if we had a two patient room, a return grill, a large return grill directly above the head of each patient would be the best solution. Agreed? If you had a two patient room, that is what I would want to do. Yes. Same and thing. I would also want to put a divider between them. Okay. Yeah. Even if it's just a curtain. Yeah. But you're here now you're hearing opinion. <laughs> I just want to be clear. Opinion yeah, yeah. based on 30 years of experience. Well, that would be my not opinion, CFD modeling yeah. and not, and not science. Sure. And Jim, I don't know if you want to get to this, but came up in Ben yesterday with making a lot of rooms negative, sort of the need to rebalance the whole system in a hospital too, because you, you know, you may throw everything out of, out of, uh, I don't know. Air that is exhausted from a building is going to come back into the building somewhere. And if we are not controlling it, it, then it will find its way from somewhere else. Uh, and, and we're going to, I, I, I do think we're, there's actually one one of these facilities where we're talking about um, making patient rooms negative and it's a 1970 something facility the windows haven't been changed the skin is what it was which means it's fairly porous and if we make a room significantly negative we're going to be sucking moisture and this is in the south so we're going to be sucking moisture through the building walls and that could cause some significant problems down the road. So you, one, you really do one have of our biggest problems. outbreaks of aspergillosis was Riverside, California, where the end result was they had a university with a farmer's field across the street. They would till that land all the time. The building was negative and it was drawing in all of the uh, spores from the, front, from the fields. And so we've got to be very careful as we start to just think we can throw air out of the building without accommodating bringing more air into the building. Absolutely. I agree. That's why some of these solutions on the fly were just very poorly thought out. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Hey, Jim, actually, uh, I think I just heard the word university come out of your mouth, Doug. So um, is any of your area of expertise um, around universities? And the only reason I ask is I have uh, direct team members and colleagues who are, you know, we're talking about healthcare, but this is a much bigger topic than healthcare, unfortunately. Um, it, does, does Mazzetti and or your area of uh, focus encompass universities by chance? Well, much of the earlier part of the conversation where we weren't talking about specific spaces, it, it's, it's universal. It's not, not really focused on healthcare. Um, so yes, Mazzetti does, does do some university work. Uh, we'd be happy to have a conversation about that. Awesome. Thank you. All right, guys, we've got to go. And we're at that time. Thank I think. So Appreciate it. Awesome. Bye, Doug. Yeah. Bye, Doug. Thank, Thank you, Doug. Better. I have a hard stop as well, Donna, so we probably uh, want to wrap up and just uh, any next steps, and then I know we're going to continue the conversation with some other thought leaders in a few weeks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so we'll make sure we get the slides from all the presenters to everybody in the Dropbox. Um, again, um, I think, Jim, you're the last one standing here, but thank you uh, very thank much. Thank you, Jim. It was awesome. A, um, thank you. You know, I, I just uh, uh, reached out to him after our Ben meeting and said, you know, I, I love so much what you did and I thought it was really applicable to our conversation. So he agreed um, very, very quickly to join us today. So um, thank you again. Very, very happy much. to do it. I think it really added a lot to the conversation. Um, just a reminder to everybody, part two will be uh, on July 10th. Um, I th we changed the time a bit to accommodate the speakers. So um, I think our start time is uh, 9.30 Pacific time. We'll set it up for three hours because we're going to have um, 
three speakers and you know if Jim and Doug and Jonathan can join us again and you know add to the conversation um, from today that would be great um, and uh, you know hopefully this helped uh, address the topic that you guys um, requested and we wanted to provide a little backdrop and um, you know some some science if you will behind the whole topic so hopefully it it, it um, address what you guys wanted and, and uh, we're on, on track. So we'll talk more about the ASHRAE position paper. We'll have uh, Tracy Hedigan and uh, Stephanie um, join us and um, uh, Walt Vernon. So, awesome. All right. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a great uh, weekend. Have a good right. weekend. And if you was taking off next week, enjoy your time off. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you. Bye, Thanks. folks. Bye. Bye. Bye.